All right, welcome back to Adventures in Angular. Chuck is not with us today. Unfortunately, he had a headache, but fear not because today we have Subrat. Hello. Armin. Hi, everyone. And also me, Lucas Paganini. So today we're going to talk about something that Armin was very excited. So it is related to the latest versions of NGRX. Armin, would you like to take it from here and give the audience your introduction to the subject? Yeah, sure. Let's start with an overview of kind of like what's new in NGRX. Uh, so if you have uh, been, if you have listened to the previous episodes when I was around, uh, we talked a lot about NGRX. So you might know that I am like a huge fan. I've actually contributed uh, a lot to the documentation. Uh, sadly, not so much to the like uh, source code, but still. Uh, so now with uh, Angular undergoing lots of major changes with standalone components and all these functional components going around and functional programming, uh, NGRX is also taking a step to uh, try to kind of reduce the boilerplate code that we write a lot with uh, most of the state management libraries. Uh, especially NGRX is, is kind of like known for having too much boilerplate. You have reducers, you have selectors, uh, writing actions is kind of tedious and so on. Uh, so uh, in, in, in the first part, I, I want to talk about the uh, new utilities that they introduced that can help reduce this uh, boilerplate code. Uh, next, I want to talk a bit about the standalone APIs because now we support standalone components. Uh, and maybe touch a little bit on uh, what's going to come next. There are some interesting uh, like RFCs going on in the uh, NGRX repo. Uh, so other exciting things are also coming our way. Uh, so maybe we can start with uh, discussing what they have new in terms of uh, writing boilerplate. Uh, they have uh, like two new interesting features. Uh, one is the create action group thing. Uh, and uh, create features. So let's talk a bit about them. Uh, in general, we are already had a function that allowed us to create an action. Like in, in the very first versions, action was just any object that had the type property. And of course, there were lots of different approaches. Like some people wrote classes, some people wrote enums for that. Then some people were just sending strings all around. Uh, then they uh, introduced the create action function, which would take the uh, type of the action and return a function that uh, creates the uh, action that we want to dispatch. So in that way, we can pass a payload parameter or something. Um, and of course, it was uh, really very helpful. They uh, are kind of deprecating the previous syntax that was used. Uh, I think in newer versions, no one is already using like other approaches. So we just stick to create action. Um, but create action still uh, kind of has lots of um, boilerplate. Like if I need to create 10 actions, I need to write create action, create action, create action like 10 times. Uh, and uh, also there is this approach that they uh, try to enforce among users that they want you to, uh, when defining an action or when we create the type of the action, they want us to prefix it with the uh, kind of like the feature or the source from where we expect the action to be dispatched, right? Like if it's yeah. a home page related action, they want in, in square brackets, they want to have home page and uh, the type of the action and so on and so on. Uh, so writing this all, all the time takes a lot of time. Uh, and uh, so now, we have, yeah. <laughs> so now we have this create action group function and it actually utilizes uh, TypeScript uh, uh, literal types, like when we can use string literals to define types, to create uh, type safe functions from one object. So the general idea is when we call create action group, we pass an object, uh, we pass the source, which we just name, the, so let's say, for example, the component when we expect this action to be dispatched. And then we can list events uh, like a dictionary. So the keys are going to be just the name, the types of the actions without the source, because we already gave the source in the previous argument. And then we can, uh, the values are going to be just the props 
that the uh, that the actions are going to expect. So we can do props and something something that's going to be sent as a payload. Or if we don't have props for that action, we can pass empty props. There's also a function called empty props to use with the action group. Mm -hmm. So the cool thing about it is that uh, we write action types like normal English words with spaces, no camel case, just like something like a you know, home page opened or something like that. But uh, using TypeScript literal types, they uh, it, it returns an object whose keys are those typed names, but in camel case and starting from a like lowercase letter. So, it's, so the ID knows you have these methods. It's completely type safe. It is inferred from just the key string that we have passed, transformed with TypeScript into just uh, the camel case uh, variant of that type. So we can just call it as a function. Uh, and it's really, really helpful. Uh, it reduces both like a lot. Uh, essentially, we just write one create action group per uh, like a feature in our app. We have one reducer. So I will just have one create action group, create all the actions for that reducer and use them there. It returns one object. So I don't need to think whether I should import 10 actions or we should import everything as something and use it that way. All, all those questions are like in the past. You can just use it to get one object with all the actions. And the type safety there is really cool. And it, and, and it also is used in the next one uh, that I uh, want to mention. So. Um, yeah, before uh, uh, I mean, yeah. sorry to interrupt. I have a I have a question like, which yeah. I uh, got uh, in my in my videos as a comment. Lot lot of people say that. So some people like the props way, and some some people like the factory way. Like the what I meant to say is the like props factory by which is a ES six way to. Yeah. So is it possible in both the scenario? Or, Absolutely. or only the props yeah. uh, props is possible. Yeah. Essentially, props is just returning a function that is uh, a like props constructor. So we can just provide that function without using props. We just need to provide the normal thing, the signature, like well, what is it expecting? So it's not like using implicit any or something. You can just write any function. Uh, I think it's going to require that that function returns an object. Okay? Because mm -hmm. essentially, that uh, if I remember correctly, I, I, I uh, so that in the source code, like it works in a way that the props function, it really isn't just returning the object of the props, but it really creates the entire action. Uh, or if you provide another function, it combines what your function has returned with the action type. That that's what it essentially does. Okay. So it will it is it's gonna require that you return an object from that custom like constructor. But I think it was the case with create action too. It, it's not different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so think... yeah, you can definitely do that. Yeah. So I think sure. they have wrapped the create create action inside inside a like a common name and and some events. Uh, yeah, yeah. They they sort of did that uh, exact thing. Uh, I uh, I was really interested how, on how they implemented like uh, like transforming uh, mm -hmm. object keys to camel case uh, method names. Uh, so I went on to the, the source code. It's really short, like it's 40 lines and most of it's just some TypeScript magic, but n not too much either. Like mm -hmm. um, they are just roll, they, they create a type, a generic type that accepts a string literal. Then they uh, like uh, break it down and uh, add all the, all them in like a, a loop using the like key of for like key in something in where you can do in TypeScript object. And they get those types, uh, and then they separately do the JavaScript part of creating it, and just uh, just uh, force the as unknown as this type that we have created from the object. Like they're really sure that it's gonna be the same thing. So yeah, essentially, it's like uh, they're kind of bargaining with TypeScript, but TypeScript still like allows it. And it's really helpful. Uh, it's no really one wants to use to see like the advancement of TypeScript. Uh, as good, far yeah. as how we can map what we want. Because I remember like not too long ago, there were so many things that we had to write a TypeScript code differently than how we would write JavaScript code because we wanted to uh, comply with a TypeScript compiler. And now it becomes much more flexible in a way to allow type safety 
with even more advanced scenarios. So for the audience that doesn't know what Armin was uh, was mentioning with template literals in the more recent versions of TypeScript, not super recent, but still kind of recent, you can define, just like you can define string and number literals on TypeScript. So you can say the number of this is not just, the type of this is not just a number. It's actually like either one or two. So you can define number literals. TypeScript in, introduced something called uh, template literals. So it is kind of like a string literal, but you have placeholder for variables. So what this allows you to do is, for example, uh, I'm going to bring an example of a technology that I believe most that are listening to this have used before, which is Express.js. The way that you define routes in Express.js is by just calling like app.get or .post, and then you pass a string, which is the path for the route that you're going to add a, a handler. And when you need variables in the URL, so you want, for example, slash user la slash user ID, you put um, a column in front of the user ID parameter. And this way, when you get the request, you're going to do requests.params, and then you can access the user ID from there. So why am I going back to Express.js? Because with TypeScript template literals, you can now type the way that Express.js constructs those URLs so now, if you use the latest versions of Express with the latest uh, type definitions, then if you define a route that is slash user slash column user ID, when you access the request dot params, there it is going to be typed as an object that has the user ID property. So how does TypeScript know that the param user ID exists? It is parsing the string that you give to Express.js. So this is the power of template literals, is a way for you to tell TypeScript that the way that we are formatting our strings has a special meaning. So in this particular case that we're talking about NGRX, um, if you look for the code of it, it will be easier for you to see. But since we are in an audio format, uh, content consumption. I'll try to explain it. So the the function that Armin was introduction introducing here is called create action group. And when you call this function, you pass an object, and the properties of this object are source, which is the namespace. So for example, before if you had like a user's namespace, and then you had a bunch of of actions related to users, then now you can define users as the string for the source. Of the when you call create action group and the other property is called events and events takes a key value map so i'm just repeating what armin said but just to fixate the content so when you pass uh, your key value object in the events property you're not gonna pass the keys in camo case you're gonna just write them in a capitalized way as you would write a normal text so let's say that you want to define an action from the namespace users and the action is create user so you're going to call create action group the source is going to be users because the module is user in the events property you're going to pass a key value object with a property called create user and the way now this is the magic here the way that you write create user is not camel case you're going to type it as you would type a normal a normal text to, to your coworker on Slack. So you're going to type create with an uppercase C space user. And then you're going to uh, define like the properties of this action. But the, the magic here is that what NGRX gives back from as the result, as the return from create action group is a enum. And each property of this enum is a function and the functions are directly created from the names of the events that you pass. So you're going to get an enum back and you're going to do dot create user. But now you're not going to write create user like create with a, an uppercase C space user. You're just going to write it in camel case format. 
And this is only possible because of all the magic that TypeScript allows us to do with template literals. And this is what Armin was saying that he was looking at the source code and it was amazingly just 40 lines with probably some hacks here and there, but at the end of the day, uh, it works magically. So this is the abstraction that we're getting from NGRX. Yeah, uh, I, I had the, uh, that's a, that's a really good example, like the one you provided. Uh, I had a smaller like use case, but where I couldn't fit those template uh, types mm -hmm. really neatly. We had a function that could uh, I don't remember like exactly, but it could change some uh, style value related to size, like in pixels or percents or something. So it needed to get a string rather than a number. But what if we wanted to force a specific format of string? Like we need a number that is uh, suffixed with either percent sign or px or rem or em or something like that so we can just define that argument of the function type as like a string the first place always is going to be number so any number uh, and then after that we're going to give a union type of either string uh, uh, sorry of either percent sign as a string or either px as a string and so on and so on uh, and, it, and it will just enforce it like we cannot pass another type of string to that and that sounds really cool uh, also it will warn against passing just strings like for example if we get some value from a database like and we want to uh like pass it dynamically to change a style of an element with this function uh just giving it a string even if the, even if it's just a generic string it doesn't really know that it doesn't really know if that it violates this contract it will still uh, give you an error and say it's just a string make sure that if you are sure it's okay just put like as unknown as this type so i know that like this this string is gonna be what you uh, kind of make it to be and it's like really cool uh i really love the direction the typescript is going on uh focusing mm -hmm. on the small dynamic things that have really big impact uh, without the, uh, the things that we mentioned, uh, having something like create action group wouldn't be possible. We, have, we would have to like yeah. give the literal names. Mm -hmm. uh, so essentially, TypeScript is not JavaScript in the sense that they, when they release a new version of TypeScript, it, it means like nothing for JavaScript because it's, it's TypeScript. So, but mm -hmm. in these cases, we just see that with advancement of TypeScript, JavaScript libraries also go forward, writing better code in that sense. Yeah. I think what I saw like in as a trend, first it came to TypeScript and slowly they adapt in JavaScript as well. Uh, there is, yeah, there, there is even a suggestion uh, in TC39 uh, to uh, add optional types to JavaScript, not in the mm -hmm. sense that like have really type checking, but allowing type annotation in GS code, which would be, like if they get it, it would be enormous for TypeScript because now we will get way less like build times uh, because TypeScript won't go around the app, app, app removing all the type annotations and it will better for like uh, source maps uh, would be also smaller. They can easier uh, like debugging TypeScript code, especially in a newer browser would be way easier. It's just, it would be almost like a one-to-one -one relationship between like source code TS and uh, resulting JavaScript, and if if they have that, that, that that's gonna be really cool. It, it will make converting to TypeScript even easier. You can just leave. If you add, add something in a, if you have a JS file, you convert something to it, it to TS, and you get a bunch of errors. You don't really wanna suppress them. You want to work on it, then maybe come back later. So you can just work on, on it as a TS file, add some annotations, change it back to JS. Okay, it now works in the browser. You don't have errors. Then you come back later, change it to TS again, get the errors, try to fix them. So yeah, it, it's really going to be great for types if this goes through. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. I am already spoiled by TypeScript. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> even if I'm writing JavaScript code, because for whatever reason, I'm just hacking a little thing real quick. So I don't want to create the entire environment of compiling TypeScript. So 
Um, let's say that I'm just writing something real quick. As soon as it gets to like 40 lines of code, I'm already going to start adding type annotations. And the way that I do that right now is using JSDoc. Uh, so I've, I just write JSDoc comments on JavaScript files. And if you use a very specific syntax, VS Code supports that. So VS Code understands the type annotations that you're writing in JS doc, and it actually adds the types to the JavaScript variables. Like VS Code can actually understand it, which is amazing. So even when I'm just creating JavaScript, I'm already adding the annotations as comments. So if we get that built in on the language, it would be awesome. But in any case, we deviate. Um, yeah. So let's I go back to... I was about to say back to NGRX. Yes. Uh, let's get back to NGRX. Armin, what else do you have that's interesting uh, for the audience? Yeah. Uh, so the next one is even bigger than like Create Action Group. Uh, it's called Create Feature. Uh, so let's first understand what's a feature in NGRX. So when we start a basic app with NGRX, we have a root store and we have feature store. So root stores is just one object that has some keys and all those keys are reducers that are correspond to some part of the application. All of those key reducer pairs are actually also features. Like we can uh, plug that piece with create feature selector and work only with that part of the state, which is super useful when we have like different parts interacting and we don't want to get the entire state and write something like state dot name of my feature dot something all the time. Uh, so essentially a feature is just a, a key and reducer pair, right? Mm -hmm. And when we have uh, lazy loading, we can also activate like lazy loading of features. If there is a part of the application that is not present initially, we don't need to run effects for it. Uh, we don't need to have that state that, that those pages aren't available yet. So in those modules, or if you are using standalone in, in the router path, we can define a store, mo a store module that for feature instead of for root. And uh, there we can uh, also provide a um, key reducer pair, like a string that's name of the feature and a reducer. Now only when the user navigates that page uh, or that component, you will get the uh, feature added to the root state, right? Uh, so writing features was just that with the, the, some people would create an enum. I used to do that. Like I would create an enum with the names of the features so they don't get mixed up. Like if I have a typo in that name, it would be really hard to find. Those are magic strings. Uh, or, uh, I, I don't know, some other approaches, there are some runtime checks that can be activated, but that still didn't yeah. save from all the problems. Uh, and also it's really kind of tedious. You have reducer one in one place. You have to write selectors manually, even if your state is really simple. So what they did is uh, they uh, allow you to just create a feature. Uh, you can call create feature, you pass it a name, you write that name only in that place. It will return you the object of the feature, okay? Uh, and the next parameter is you pass a reducer of that feature and that's it. Uh, now you can just put uh, that uh, feature that the function returned in the star module dot for feature function without the name, it has already the name in it, just pass it to that function, it will be defined. But the real big deal here is that besides just creating that feature, it also creates the selectors for the state that you provide. Even if you don't explicitly write the state, like if you don't create an interface and pass it as a generic or something, in inside that reducer, you have the first argument is initial state. So you pass an object with some keys there. Let's say you have orders, users, and I don't know, books, right? Mm -hmm. That feature that has been returned from there now has selectors on it called, uh, like, uh, so let's say it's, the name is app. Uh, if your feature, you say you can say app.selectbooks, app.selectorders, app.select. Uh, you don't need to write those selectors now. So the selectors for plain selecting items from the object of the state are now provided for you. And mm. most of the part of the boilerplate like used to be those functions. Usually you had to write like 10 functions that just select something. They just really would map to one piece of the um, state object. Then you would write like free custom selectors that combine in a way them. Uh, and that was it. Uh, so now you can, you can just get those functions for free. If you need some modifications, you need to combine like a bunch of them with some other operation. You can just 
pass that selector to create selector function. And like voila, you got your uh, selectors in one place. So you just write one action group, you just write one feature, um, maybe some selectors, and that's it. You got you got a piece of a piece of store because all of them are not really interacting with effects. Effects are like separate. You can might not even have effects for some parts of your app, but these parts are interconnected. So you just have them in one place. Okay. And they even are going to add support of uh, transforming the selectors inside the create uh, feature function. So uh, you can just make it so that uh, you can pass another function to it. In, in, in the next release, they, they're going to add that. You can pass another function that will map your selectors, return uh, the whole object of the selectors that you want. The ones that you need, you can just you know spread them using like the spread operator, add some selectors in that object, and that's it. You get one object, it has all the selectors, there's the reducer, you can pass it to the store definition, uh, and you can use it in uh, selecting uh, things in, in, in components. Uh, you can easily implement like the VM approach. Sometimes people uh, combine all the selectors of one component into one like view model selector. You can easily do that with this approach. So. Uh, and so in I, one uh, create feature, we can create multiple uh, name and reducer, right? We can combine like an array or? Uh, no, you, you don't have one reducer. Uh, the idea of a feature, like uh, it's a bit abstract, like different, uh, even inside the core team, like different members approach differently to what the feature mm -hmm. is. Uh, but mm -hmm. essentially if a feature is like a piece of state that is really interrelated. So it can be as simple as like you have this page that loads some uh, articles. I don't know. So you have the list, you have a Boolean that represents if it's loading, you have an error object, you have a small reducer that handles it, you have one effect. So that's, that's all a feature. It can be really mm -hmm. small. Actually, it's better if the features are small. Like uh, if the, the, the yeah. largest part of the boilerplate is like the reducer mostly, if you can reduce uh, the reducer, <laughs> it, it, it will be really cool. Like you, you don't need to have like ten thousand cases in one reducer. That, that's really bad. I used we used to have like in our project a reducer that was one thousand five hundred lines long. Well, I was working yeah. with really different parts. It was a big deal. We broke it down. We created all the selectors. We didn't have create feature back then. If we had, it would have been simpler. We would just remove those selectors and add the, the custom ones. But still, uh, you don't you really don't want to have big reducers. The more granular the state is, I mean, anywhere in the app, the state is still global. You can access anything. So you can divide it in as many parts as you want. It's gonna work in the same way from like from like the components perspective. If there's just one global store, you can select anything from there. So no problem for the component. Mm -hmm. You don't really care how the store works behind the, the hood. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it also uses that uh, same uh, TypeScript trick as create action group does. It converts the object of your state keys, like orders, books, uh, items, I don't know, converts it to be select item, select order, select something. Uh, so it maps the accent to yeah. that name, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what it does. And it's really cool. Like You really get those selects. You don't need to write that boilerplate. You don't need to copy paste anything. You just have it. Oh, that's like really like cool. uh, just to just to clarify suppose i am writing uh, in inside a reducer there are four on event so then we then in the selector you will get four uh, four state to map uh, right from the yeah, feature no you, you mentioned the on function mm -hmm. and it's not on about the on function it's about the initial state like you can have mm -hmm. a bunch of different on functions, like they are called okay, okay. reducer handlers or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you can modify like one item in seven different on. You, you is the initial state that is being mapped to a selector. Okay. If you have yeah, Perfect. if you pass the first argument, it has something like on users array or mm -hmm. like is loading something. It will create different so like select is loading select users. Um, and you can have anything in your reducer. The reducer syntax hasn't changed at all. Like even when you define the reducer, you just write create reducer and pass it to that reducer yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, property on create feature function. And Armin, uh, um, yeah. I'm curious to know how those changes affect the best practices for NGRX because um, I'll be honest here, it's been a while since I don't look at the official docs for NGRX. But the last time that I was reading their official docs, 
they still had the old way of creating selectors and actions and etc. And they even suggested creating tests for selectors. So the best practice would be to create the selectors, create unit tests for the selectors. So it ended up creating really a lot of boilerplate every time that you that you try to create the new NGRX store. So I wonder now that those things got easier, if they have changed in any way the best practices that they recommend, both in terms of file structure, because there's even a recommended file structure for NGRX, which is creating a file dedicated for the actions, another dedicated for the selectors. So um, how does that boilerplate redu reduction affects the best practices recommended by the NGRX team or it doesn't affect at all? Uh, it's a really good question because uh, actually NGRX, uh, what I love about it is really opinionated. Like they try to, as you said, they have a recommended folder structure. Like even Angular doesn't really have that. We have this style guide, but it's not something that, you know, there is a big example of how every Angular app should. But NGR is like, no, 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 create folders for this, this that you have this, these files. Name the selector something like from something, dot select something. Mm -hmm. uh, with these new approaches, it's actually easier for NGRX to enforce those uh, best practices. Like take, for example, the action, uh, they call it, uh, the uh, action hygiene approach, uh, like adding the source of action to the type. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the basic idea is that you always know where this action originated from, and uh, you can see it in the store dev tools if you use something like that. So uh, there's really no way of enforcing that best practice, right? Like users of NGRX can just skip the source. And then they will go around like scratching their head, well, which is the source of this one, which is the source of that. And it's really hard to find and then refactor that. We've gone through that. I <laughs> don't know about those practices. But now if you create a create action group, it just, it just forces you to provide the source of the actions. So you don't even need to know about like that best practice. You just get a source on it because it, it requires you to pass it. Uh, kind of same goes with the selectors on create feature uh, so selectors are just functions right we can we can even just skip create selector uh, like the, the factory function which just write a function it will select something from the uh, NGRX store uh, but uh, there is this approach that you need to prefix your uh, selector with the word select like if you're selecting books the selector should be called select books not books not uh, some books not books from store just select whatever you are selecting and at first, uh, I actually wrote the documentation page for that um, the best, like they have the yes, lint rules there. Uh, there. They have a rule that enforces this. So uh, I didn't like it because it when you were select, actually selecting something from the store, you get this repetition of like this store select, select books, select, select. So I didn't like it. But I, I, I kind of get uh, why they're doing it in that way because um, so components aren't like the only place where you use selectors. You use it in unit tests, how you're going to see in the code that this is a selector and this is just maybe another function if they're all called the same. Or maybe you have, uh, you, you are writing unit tests. Maybe you called your selector books. Now you want to create a, a mock array to like uh, test that. You're, you're going to go call that array books. Now you have a problem, right? So just call it select whatever you are selecting. Uh, but previously, again, no way to enforce it. You can use the S-Link plugin, but I'm, I'm sure not everyone is doing that. And it is also in the kind of a relaxed part of the uh, rules. So usually it installs the recommended setting and that rule doesn't get inside because most of people are already messing it up. So they're not very strict with that. And no way to enforce that. But now create feature already creates those uh, selectors uh, prefixing now with select this, like that. Uh, so yeah, uh, adhering to best practice just got easier. You don't, you don't need to do anything. Android is creating your selector names for you. Just provide your state or whatever. Gotcha. Uh, yeah, and and also yeah, you know, less code means less potential for having bad code. Uh, it's a really less is always good. Yeah. Um, well, mostly like in ninety-five percent. Sometimes I yeah. I want something to be like more explicit. 
but uh, mm-hmm. I don't like like magic manipulations. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, uh, there is uh, this uh, like you can use uh, what I suggest to anyone who is using NGRX, especially for reducers. Like you, you really need to use NGRX Emer. Uh, it, it's if you are familiar with Emer.js. Uh, so Emer.js allows you to write the code in imperative style, modifying an object. But instead of actually modifying the object you are working with, it's, it's going to return a copy, the same way that you need in, uh, let's say, a reducer, right? So when you reducer, if you want to change something that is deeply nested, you need to go like copy the state, copy this field, copy that nested field, copy that nested field, find something in an array maybe. Uh, but with Emer.js, you can just write like state dot I don't know books uh, index dot something equals to something. Uh, uh, it it gives you an Emer on function that works the same as the on function, but it 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 works with Emer under the hood. Now, that is also a big improvement like you can do with reducers. You have a lot of way less code, it'll be way more readable, especially if you are doing complex like things with the data. Like that your backend is sending something that is ugly, you need to change it so that it fits with the component. You are doing some manipulations, nested objects. Usually, you already have this kind of application when you uh, use NGRX, right? Yeah. So now with reducers, you would have to write lo- lots of code, which is just copying, 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 copying an object to find this this one nested thing that you're gonna change. So I always suggest to use like NGRX image. It really, really makes reducers work the same way. You just write less code. It's it's imperative, and in those positions, it's more understandable. Like you literally see what you are changing on the state. Yeah. I have you a don't question need... for you, yeah. Armin. Okay. Um, you were mentioning Emer, and as soon as you said Emer, you touched a pain point for me. Uh, so I want your opinion on this. It's a little bit uh, out of topic, but since we're talking about Emer, I really like the idea of Emer, especially when it was rising, because when it was rising, Immutable.js was dead for a while now, so the community needed a replacement, and Emer came to the rescue to provide this this replacement. But I truly never felt very comfortable using it in production with a team of developers. The problem wasn't production, but using it with a team of developers, because um, it seems so magical that when it doesn't work, you can get easily frustrated because it does have some very uh, specific particularities, especially when you're talking about um, object instances. So when it needs to replicate another object instance, it's not such an easy fit to do with the magic um, interface that Emer provides. And then... As soon as I was, as soon as I was getting more and more concerned about that and about maybe some coworkers having trouble understanding when it fails and when it works, then Immutable JS came back. So that actually put me in a position of questioning if Emer is still the best option, knowing that Immutable JS has come back and it is now uh, consistently being updated and supported by not just a single person, but a group of people. So uh, it seems that we don't have the risk of the same thing happening again and immutable jazz getting stuck for a long time. So now that we have this comeback for immutable jazz and knowing that Emer provides this magical interface that people could be confused, um, do you still believe your own team Emer and not the team Immutable JS? And if so, why? Uh, so uh, maybe I'm gonna be a bit biased because I've, I've not really used Immutable JS, but uh, like, so there's two answers to this. One is from the general perspective, and one is from the NGRX perspective. So from the NGRX perspective, our main like frustration with Emer is that you cannot like Emer uh, an instance of a class. You need to modify that class. There is this symbol you add Emerable true something something. There are workarounds, but it is all ugly. Uh, but the thing is, NGRX already doesn't allow you to have class instances in uh, uh, as, as as part of state. 
You can't have methods on state. It's gonna, you only can provide serializable data. If your data is not serializable, it's gonna throw away all the methods. It's gonna have, it's gonna throw away anything that cannot be serialized, like a file instance, a file reader, or something, something the other. It's gonna play in the, 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 gonna keep the plain data. So from NGRX perspective, you already have this tool which works with Emer. Uh, you don't really need to think about anything because you couldn't have used whatever Emer is not providing anyway. So if you just want, if you just want Emer for NGRX, you are really cool with just using NGRX Emer package. It was created by Tim Deschriver. He's from the core team of NGRX, so it's not like a third party, really third party thing. It's not integrated directly into uh, NGRX, but maybe one day, yeah, the ESLint rule package was also used to be a separate one, then we integrated it in the uh, main packages. So maybe in the future it will just be in the core or maybe some helper library that they will roll out. So yeah, from NGRX perspective, uh, uh, you already have a tool that just writes reducers in an Emer way. If you use Immutable GS, you're gonna write the reducer you used to, but call Immutable GS, so you're gonna be, uh, have a callback in a callback get the same thing that you yeah. already get as usual in uh, NGRS Emer. Uh, but in general, uh, well, sure, if you look at it that way, uh, of course, Emer has a shortcoming, like we, we can't work with class instances. Although I don't really like OOP. For me, Emer is a way that allows to write simpler functional code and in that scenario, I don't need to have classes. Like, uh, it's okay if I have occasionally, maybe. Uh, if you're not like a purist, oh no, this is a class. Like everyone in the React community is going. Like they, they killed class components so fast. Uh, at work, I sometimes do interviews for also React positions. I used to do a bit of React in 2018 or something, uh, specifically like React Native. And uh, it, it was the dawn of hooks and functional really components. Now they just murdered the class components. The community yeah. murdered them. Uh, even if the team is saying, no, you know, class components are okay, big logic. Just use class components. They are more predictable than these hooks and so on. But no, they just murdered it. Uh, so if you're not a purist, yeah, maybe, okay, you're going to have some, uh, I don't know, classes in uh, a code base that's mainly using functional programming. But if you are really using functional programming, you're not going to write class-based components, for example. And you sure as hell is not going to write classes for models, right? Like your data objects. If you write classes for them, you are doomed to just use the, if you write like state modification logic in, in a class of, for some model, uh, why even have like, that logic in, in a reducer, for example, you just can't call that uh, and get. Uh, we use class approaches in our app together with like NGRX. We're not like completely out of uh, OOP and everything. But uh, in uh, when we want to have classes that can also exist on the state, uh, what is our approach in general? Like we write a class that represents something that we're going to send to the server, something like, I don't know, user model. Uh, we usually make sure to implement an inter interface. One of the functions that we're going to implement is the one that serializes that. Uh, so it returns the serialized version. We're not delegating into NGRX to avoid any problems. Uh, and another function we create uh, is a static method that would uh, create this class, but uh, not serialize it. So we can create it from some value, for example, from a form value, like we have a reactive form, we create this instance from the form, the logic of handling that is encapsulated in the model. And when we really want to uh, send it to NGRX, like to handle an effect, or just, we call the serialize uh, uh, method on it. So we, we're just sending plain data. Anyway, we couldn't, we couldn't send a method there. Anyway, we cannot send a method to uh, you're just going to be careful with the selectors, but you can really provide the type in a way that users don't get confused and think that, oh, you know, this is the kind of like the instance of that model. I'm going to call this method, but this method doesn't exist because it's just the values of the properties, mm -hmm. not, not the methods. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't really see... Uh, I think if you if you want to do something with Emer with a class, maybe something is, is, is kind of wrong. 
in, in that code. Maybe maybe don't really need that. You still can do that. You can add the immutable true to the class, and uh, it will handle in gotcha. a way. It still has problems. Mm -hmm. It's not like mm -hmm. it won't do it ideally. I think if you have like a file object on your uh, class instance, it, it's not going to work that way. I think. Perfect. Um, I love I love your answer. It was very on point. Thank you, Arme. Uh, like the context that you gave about, well, if you're using NGRX, then you're not using uh, class instances, so there's no problem. And also, if you're in a code base that prefers functional programming, then you also don't have problems with that. So, yes, this does make a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, you more for me. Yes, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah. It's, it's really justifiable. Uh, Let's talk also a bit about the standalone APIs of yeah. NGRX. It's a, like a simpler topic. Uh, so of course, Angular already had support for like using old modules with standalone components. We can just call something like uh, import providers form, if I remember correctly the name of the function. Uh, but uh, the NGRX team, uh, being the cool guys they are, <laughs> just released uh, directly the API we can use with the store. So there are functions called provide store. Uh, there are functions called like provide effects. Uh, they receive the same argument as the module for root, module for feature uh, method did. So you, don't, you really can just uh, slice away the store module dot for root and just replace it with provide store. And I also have an API with like provide mock store. It's also just a function uh, and the, the, for testing, uh, obviously. And uh, the funny thing is that you just uh, provide like mock values for uh, what the selectors are going to return. So that's how you work with the components now. Like you don't uh, mock the store really. You mock the selectors, right? You, you are, like your component uses three different selectors. You just write provide mock selectors like uh, selector this and value this. I, I expect this in your uh, like test specs. Uh, uh, so the standalone APIs uh, uh, also kind of like showcase that NGRX grows with Angular. Yeah, there is uh, some other interesting features are lining up. Uh, so now because we have the inject function, uh, if previously we needed to make an instance of a class, Right to write effects because in effects we usually made uh, calls to methods in other services, so we needed dependency injection there. Uh, like reduces the pure functions, so we don't need dependency injection there. But uh, the uh, sorry, like uh, the effects, you need some uh, services for dependency injection, so you, you had to use classes. And in reality, it didn't like make a lot of sense because. We didn't use classes. Those effects usually are really separated from each other. It's a class that is created just for the sake of dependency injection, right? Um, and it's purely you just create observables there. Like, why, why do you need classes for this? And now that we have the inject function, uh, NGRX is going to allow, uh, it's, it's not still, uh, it's still in a discussion, but most probably it will go through soon. Uh, they have, uh, you can just create effects. With the create effect function, no, uh, like, no need to write a class. That this effect equals like on something equals create effect. Like write export the... as a as a variable. You can export that as a variable yeah, yeah. and use that. Yeah, uh, and you can just import. You don't need to import this effect separately. You can just import everything from those effect files, pass it to provide effects uh, function in a standalone like uh, situation. So um, this will reduce, it's not really reduced code, like uh, you would need to inject actions every time in your effect. So uh, I'm kind of split on it, but uh, what you can do, you can write a wrapper around create effect function, which already injects the uh, like the create action, uh, sorry, the actions uh, observable and whatever service you want and pass it as an argument to your callback in create effect. So now you will just have them in the argument, right? You can pass them as an object, so you can optionally pick which ones you need for a particular effect, and just use it. So uh, it may be uh, a bit of uh, increase in the amount of like symbols you write, but maybe the lines of course will get less. I don't know, but uh, it still feels way more functional. And effects also, they're also functions that just work with observables. They aren't really 
anything related to OP, the state that you have on the uh, effect class, you don't really have state on it. You just define effects. You don't really write some other properties and use them in the effect. Like I've never seen anything like that. You don't really need a class there. You just use a class for dependency injection. Now you can just digit class, uh, write a wrapper, and pass uh, it to uh, arguments to the callback you're going to use and just create effect in the way that you uh, want the same way in previous like the code of those effects are not going to change you can just convert the effects that you have to that uh, anyway it's still not released but i think it's gotta be uh, discussion went really well on the rfc so maybe uh, in the next version we'll, we'll probably see something like that yeah that's uh I like so I mean, I have I have a question about mm -hmm. the uh, standalone component. So in the standalone component, you told like we can just in the provider we can write provide uh, state or provide. Uh, so so how Angular will going to handle like previously, if you provide something on a component, the the state of that will stay to that component. Like so, it, will it be the state? Uh, global state will be provided to the same component or it's a similar state will be created we are, yeah uh, uh, I actually ran into that when I tried to provide it in my root component you don't provide it in the root component you actually what you do you provide it on the uh, bootstrap uh, application uh, that's what all the, the the function in main TS when we use the standalone you can provide also there you provide the root store there and the funny thing is that you provide feature stores in the routers. Like in the routes, you have this maybe lazy loaded component. It has also a feature. You can just add providers there. Angular like allows it starting from uh, version 15. Mm -hmm. so you can just add it on lazy loading and say, oh, provide this feature state for only these routes. Uh, you don't, uh, you never write anything about the store in, in, in your standalone component. You just write inject store and that's it. Mm -hmm. And no need to import there. Just uh, it's a global thing. Okay. It's okay, like to put it in the Bootstrap application uh, function. Mm -hmm. uh, Going back to what you said, Subrat, about before, if you provided something in the component level, it was only available to the component and to the child elements and components for that yeah. component. So the way that I see the changes that standalone APIs made to the dependency injection system is this way. I look at standalone components and I just imagine that they now have the same functionalities and responsibilities that the ng modules that used to define them, that used to declare them have. So um, I see it as like, if I am providing something in a standalone component, it would be the same thing as if it weren't a standalone component and I was pr providing that in the in an ng module that only imports and declares that specific component. So mm -hmm. um, the same thing applies for the routes. So instead of you having a module for each specific route, you can have functional APIs for the routes. And then the providers that would be in the route module, in that feature route module, they now go directly to the functions that you define with uh, when you define your routes using the functional API. So I don't know if that helps, but this is the mind, um, the mind map that I have, how I, I connect the new ways of dependence, using dependency injection with those functional APIs and standalone APIs, how I connect that from the legacy way of doing that. Um you know what's interesting is that uh, you know some people are, are like complaining online about like you are making angular to look more like react yeah uh, and i kind of get that uh, but what i disagree with is that you know when i when i use like functional components in react with hooks and everything it looks so beautiful like explaining it would be really easy right if you have just, oh, use state, this is the variable, this is the function that sets it, and this is some HTML, and that, that's beautiful. Use effect does side effects, and so on and so on. Uh, and, and obviously, Angular doesn't have that. You have a class, you have everyone's injection, and it's, it's really hard to like uh, explain dependency injection to a newcomer. Like, 
what is dependency injection? What is dependency, especially if they come from a React background, like they don't really aren't into OP too much. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, actually, the problem that people have with React is not how it is it, how React is written, but how it works with like rendering, how it works under the hood. Like the big problem that React faces, and and don't get me wrong, I'm not like dissing React. Uh, it's still a, a great like framework that people use. It's not a library; it's framework. <laughs> You're not gonna debate yeah. me on that, but I think uh, we can. This is Angular podcast, so we can. Yeah. React. <laughs> no, uh, I enjoy how React is written. When I write React components, sometimes it's so cool, like in functional way and everything. But the problem is how it handles uh, like the re-renders and everything. So what they did was like, uh, you know, they it's really lightweight. So oh, you want to uh, handle some event from the child component in the parent. Uh, you know what, the simplest approach, just pass a callback to the child component as props, mm -hmm. right? Like it works. It's, it's a really legitimate way to do that. But when they switch to functional components from class-based components, what they discover, like uh, not really discovered how the components work is that every time you call something like use state or something in use effect calls use state, it will just call the, the function you are in and get the new template because your function is returning the JSX template, right? And now you've got a problem. If you're creating a callback and passing it to the child component, every time you use you call use state, uh, you will ha have a new reference to that same function. And when you pass it to the ch child component, it's gonna re-render all the way through because now it oh you know my props changed. I've got to re-render. There is no way like uh, React will know that it shouldn't re-render. There is a reference check. It only does shallow checking. Reference changed. Mm, yeah, you gotta have re-renders. So how they approach this, they created this hook called use callback, right? Uh, you provide the callback to it as an argument. Now, every time that your function is called, uh, it will return the same reference. It will memoize it, right? Every time you have a re-render, it will bring the, the old one and uh, pass it. So now you don't have re-renders. But now you have another problem. What if your callback uses some state inside it uh, that has changed from like a re-render to re-render? Right. For example, you have a counter, and somehow on every render it increments. But you are using like doing console log counter in that callback. Uh, it's gonna stay the same. You're gonna have the, the old reference to the function. So now they also introduce like a second argument where you have uh, a list of dependencies. It's not bad. Like it's a normal solution, but it's really hard to explain to someone. I guess like why are we doing this that way? What's the issue? What are those dependencies when you should do it? I mean, Angular, you just have an event emitter. It sends a synthetic event. Uh, you don't have a rendering problem like with the, if the parent component re-renders, uh, it isn't guaranteed that the child will re-render even if like the function is the same, it just sends you an event. So they inversed it kind of like, you're not sending a handler from parent to child, you're getting an event from child to parent, which kind of like makes more sense. Uh, and introduces less problems. So I, what I really like with these new APIs and everything in Angular is they're introducing like how we write code in React, but not how it works under the hood. Essentially under the hood, nothing's yeah. changed. Like the same engine is rendering the components. It's just that you call a function instead of writing an ng module class. That's not really a difference. Uh, everything works the same way. You just now can add imports to a standalone uh, component, and that's it. Which I think, personally, is an improvement. I don't like the implicit import import pattern. I was okay with modules. Modules was a, were a good way of like dividing. Oh, this is the users module. This is the blah 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 module. But what was bad for me in the modules is that like you implicitly import everything that is in the module. Like mm -hmm. uh, if you are in a component, this has this big HTML file. Uh, you see some component, oh, where is this component? Which one were from? Where is it imported? You're gonna add some VS code plugins so you can just click on it and go there. And and it's like, if I read a component, only the class, you have really no idea what the component is using because everything is essentially in the template, right? That's what I didn't like about modules. And I like it about how uh, you can explicitly import uh, whatever you need. Uh, I think we can like agree, uh, maybe, Maybe you import the common module in the root in the Bootstrap application, so you get the ng and everything that is built in. Everything else just import uh, in the imports array. 
uh, I even I tried making a, like a pet project on the side and uh, like using standalone. Uh, I also used only inline templates. Uh, it kind of like worked even better. It kind of forces you to like write smaller components, which is also one advantage that React has. In React, people tend to write smaller components because it's really easy to define a component. You just write a function with props. That's it. That's your component. Now with standalone, it's a bit easier to do the same in Angular. You can write a class with an input, uh, inline template. OK, you got yourself a component that works with anything. Or maybe you can add the, like change detection on push and so on. So yeah, that's the way that uh, the code is written there. But under the hood, it's always the same. So we are not introducing the problems from React. We're just getting like the code. And I think the beauty of, uh, beauty of it is like now you can use both. So wherever yeah. we need ng module and and that combine them, so it's like act as a module, and inside that you can use standalone components. So where I feel it most useful is most of the Angular project I see is is bigger project where multiple teams are working, they have individual modules of them. So they can use that ng module to export their modules, but inside the inside the ng module they can uh, create different uh, standalone component and import them to the module and so that that's a like very good approach like to exporting your standalone module as a uh, standard component as a combined module and so that other can use totally so oh. the way angular is going i think it's liking like previously the problem for angular was the change detection was slow like the i'm saying of the initial days and the you know, how they're re-rendering then the iv came like uh, i on IV, it's a very like very high improvement on, on bundle size and uh, everything. Now they are reducing that, and change detection is also improving. So, and I'm I just waiting think for that... like. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Uh, the most amazing thing I've seen with like these new things was that someone managed to use like Angular services like HTTP client in a React app with the inject function. You can create an injection context outside of a component or something. You don't need an Angular component. You don't need a decorator. You can just create an injection context because well, if you like look really deep at it, injection context is just like an object that has all your like mm -hmm. provided dependencies, right? So you can create it. You can pass it to create injector, or I don't remember quite how the function was called. Obviously, we don't use it on a daily basis. Like, uh, and then you provide there like the HTTP client from Angular in a React app. Then in a uh, React component, just call inject HTTP client and you will get the reference to the Angular HTTP client. It's like amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's really decoupled from each other. You don't need like Angular core. Uh, uh, sorry, you, you need Angular core, core plus Angular like common to do something like this. You can actually import like the, the reactive forms, maybe write a wrapper around them and use them in React. How cool is that? Mm -hmm. Whoa, yeah. that's so cool. Uh, it, it's that's still, so cool. Uh, that wrapper I mentioned is still going to be a lot of work, but you can mm -hmm. really make it. I, I'm not suggesting anyone to do that, obviously, but like, you can do that. And it's, it's just amazing. the fact so, that you can do already yeah. tells a lot about how isolated it is. So yeah. it's not about do it. It's just, it's so isolated that you could do this if you wanted, which is awesome. And yeah. Just to go back one step, um, we are already uh, talking about this for a, a little while now, so maybe we're going to close this yeah. uh, the subject. But yeah. one thing that I'd like to say is, Armin, you were saying that some people were complaining that Angular is going to the direction that React is going, so it's looking more and more like React code. I would just correct that, and to anyone who thinks that, I would say, I don't think Angular is going in the same direction. It is looking at React and going in the direction that React is going. I think that Angular is going in the direction that functional programming leads to. And it just so happens that React went into that route before. So it looks as if we are getting ideas from React, which might as well be true because why not? If they were already testing React, we already have community opinions about them and we can make it in a different way that solves the issues that React had, then why not? But I am extremely thrilled that we are going to the direction of functional programming. I 
so hope that in the future we I really hope that we will be able to create components in Angular and like create an entire application in Angular without classes. That would be awesome. And also without all the issues that React has with functional components like the ones that you were describing. So if we could have a functional API for everything in Angular without the problems that React had, then I would be super down for it. Uh, two things. Uh, they are introducing, uh, I think they are more uh, like looking at SolidJS or something like that rather than React. Well, SolidJS already uses like JSX and stuff. Uh, but uh, now they are it's in the next JSX. release, they are introducing uh, self closing tags in Angular templates for components. Uh, if you haven't seen that, like if you have uh, app uh, dash, uh, I don't know, something, something. You don't need to put a closing tag now in a template starting from version uh, 15.1, I think. Uh, and another thing that um, Minko uh, has announced on Twitter is that they're going to roll an experimental support for signals from Solid, right? Like we can use them. And now uh, they are also giving a an, uh, kind of like a way to safely detach a component from change detection cycle. So, so signal is like a, a reactive primitive, right? Uh, and it, it notifies when, itself like when it's changed. So if you use signals, you don't need change detection because it notifies about itself, right? Uh, and you don't even need to write the async pipe. You just need to call it as a function, which I kind of don't like, but it's just, you know, visuals. But under the hood, you can just ditch ZonJS. Of course, it's going to be experimental, but lots of things that are now our current reality have been experimental like two versions ago, and Angular is pretty bound on like introducing lots of cool things. Uh, maybe the community will love it. And like the standalones were experimental, like in release 14, but everyone was super excited. Now it's stable. Or well, maybe something like this will happen in uh, version 16. We will we'll get version 16, I think around summer, right? Uh, or maybe earlier in the spring. So. Uh... I was about to tell like, uh, I'm just waiting when June JS will be optional. So as a tool, yeah. So that will well, be a good, good thing. Like you can kind of make zone JS optional right now. Yeah, make, uh, yeah. Like just digital. Or you can do a lot of codes. Yeah, and that, call yeah. lots of you know, like mark for check, check or you something can, like you detect changes. changes. Yeah, you can yeah. do something like that. Uh, but you know, uh, of course, it will be better to like, just uh, if I code, if I but... remember like. Uh, Armin, with you, we had a podcast of using proxy and yeah. inside that, you right? Okay. So that if we are using that approach, then uh, then it, we can ditch John well, JS for now. Yeah, but uh, it kind of have its own downsides. Like you can't really write a function that ideally works from the outside. You need to change something in, inside how Angular works. So only the Angular code mm -hmm. can do that. But yeah, it's one approach that you can adopt. Like. Uh, you can do like uh, a function that creates signals. Okay, uh, will work the same way. Uh, it will be just you can then wrap it around a proxy or something. You can do that. So you still write like in an imperative way if you like that about yeah. uh, Angular. Nice. Um, yeah. So so it's doable, uh, definitely. Uh, it's been uh, you know it's been a, a while that like in the community there is lots of in, even in the internal chats they talk about like. And we did long jazz. Like it's, uh, it's not uh, like it's amazing still that like if you take a look at how change detection in Angular works, it's like a, uh, on the surface if you just look at how it's composed and structured, it's like a train wreck. Like you just check all the async events, you then go around, check this, check that, go through the component tree. It, it seems like a really horrible way of handling it. But they have managed to optimize it in the way that you still have really performant apps. Of course, if you ditch it and find a better approach, obviously you get better. But still, Angular is very usable with this change detection approach that they have. And it really sounds like a hack. Like you plug into all async events and check if something has changed, check if something has changed. Imagine like using uh, like constant HTTP calls instead of sockets. Like, uh, asking, asking mm -hmm. the server, has anything changed? Has anything changed? It's, it's actually the same approach with ZonJS and stuff, but they they really did lots of hard work on it to optimize it. So 
even if they never get rid of Zone.js, I'm kind of okay with that. Uh, it's just cool that it's kind of possible. Okay. Um, before picks, let's do the self-promotion part. So we're doing this before picks. Uh, so, so Brett, what are you working on that you'd like to? Yeah. So I will just try to extend uh, the podcast uh, theme to uh, as you discuss about standalone components. So I have recently released a video on standalone components. So it's just the basic of it, how you'll create and how you'll use. So the follow video will come and I will try to integrate NGRX uh, with it as well. So please go ahead and watch that. Uh, give give some comment and please subscribe. Nice. Uh, nice. To the channel. Um, you you already have this video published. Okay. Um, yes. We can put this on the video. I think, so it will be like. Yes, we can put this on the getting, show mm -hmm. notes, and I'll definitely yeah, go there. In, check out the Sims. Really, really mm -hmm. interesting. What about you, Armin? Uh, I don't think I'm working on anything in particular right now in the like uh, writing or creating something. I am writing, I had two articles on NGRX use cases. I'm kind of trying to write the third one. Uh, it's going to have like interesting uh, things on, like uh, undo and redo functionality with NGRX, uh, how to do state hydration from local storage, from so on and so on. Uh, so yeah, if you... Uh, have uh, read the previous articles. It's kind of like the same uh, idea, just different use cases. But I guess it's going to be around like two or three weeks because I'm still writing an example project for the article. I haven't started the actual article yet. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Nice. Um, that, that's it, I think, uh, okay. for right now. Awesome. Um, to me, it's the same as last time. So. I will be hammering on the subject for a while <laughs> until I, I finally release this course, but I am currently building a course on web animations. It is looking really good. We already have some videos ready. It's still in alpha stage, so only some selected alpha users have access to the course for now, but I'm really, really happy as how things are going. So the idea is not just to give you some examples, not just let's go this animation, let's go that animation. That's cool, like showing you how to do things in practice. But what I believe to be most valuable is teaching the mental models and the deep concepts and the technologies and how they work so that if you have a solid understanding of the technologies that allow you to execute web animations and if you understand those technologies and the mental model, then you can create any animations that you want. You don't need to look on the internet for examples that are super close to your particular case. You already know, you already know all the tools and you already know how to use them. So you can craft whatever you want, which is the thing that is gonna take you to the next level in the sense of motion design and web animation. So I'm really, happy with how things are going. If you want to check out uh, the waiting list for the course is open. You can join it at lucaspaganini.com slash web animations. If you join the waiting list, you will get a significant discount when the course is launched. Other than that, of course, I'm always promoting my company. So we are specialized in Angular. We are specialized in functional programming, which are things that we talked a lot here today are topics that are very uh, deep into my personal interests and also the interests of all the employees uh, for my company. So if you are looking for, um, for experts in Angular and functional programming, either to extend your team or to execute a project entirely, then you can check out unvoid.com to get in touch with us and see what we can do for you. All right. so. That's enough. We're trying to make you spend money with us. So what about picks? So Brett, do you have any picks? Yeah, so this time I think I, I, I'm almost uh, two months or mostly three months from away from India. So now I'm start, started uh, craving up uh, some Indian foods. <laughs> so I'll just pick them 
like i i love i you i love chicken biryani but i love there is a, a place called paradise biryani i think it's pretty famous it was near to my house so i always used to order or go there and eat so i just like to pick that if anyone haven't has paradise biryani or any bit chicken biryani that matter please uh, order it from your any indian store and have it yeah. but yeah uh, but here uh, in in amsterdam i had biryani but it's not like uh, what like in india but at least like far away from home still we have biryani or some something related to india that feels feels good like i think once a month i would like to have some something like that it feels like i'm i'm not lost oh i somewhere. definitely needed something like that when i traveled to europe so i couldn't thing. find a single brazilian restaurant i was so craving uh yeah. my hometown food i know how that is man nice nice pick how about you armen yeah Uh, we had this episode like scheduled a while ago, I think last month. Uh, and during the New Year break, I was watching uh, 1899 on Netflix and thought, oh, you know, this is going to be my pick when we do the episode. But then, you know, Netflix canceled it. So my pick is being frustrated with Netflix canceling 1899. <laughs> yeah, I was filming that morning. Like, uh, it was an amazing show. Um, so... If you are okay with uh, watching something that's probably gonna get, remain unfinished, go ahead. It's like great pastime, very uh, intriguing. But I was pretty sure it's gonna be an awesome uh, TV show. Like Dark, if you watch Dark, uh, it was uh, the same. The creators of Dark are making 1899. And they were even saying it's more complicated than dark. It's even more mind blowing. And uh, the first season kind of was, uh, I guess. But you know, Netflix canceled it. They say it has low completion rate, like only 30% of viewers finished it. So you know, they don't. And it's kind of a costly thing. They have lots of animations. They're actually using like uh, the whole powered Unreal Engine 5 for all the special effects and stuff. But uh, nice. You know. It's well, gone. <laughs> to be fair, if you are a fan of Dark, then you probably don't have a problem with unsettled TV series, right? So if you were okay with Dark... Well, Dark was, was settled. But it... it was completely subtle, I, I think. Okay. It's still, it's still really like, hard, uh, it it's still really hard to explain and... to my mother how everything connects. I could understand, but... Still super hard. <laughs> no, yeah, it's hard to explain. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's uh, if you understand it, it's kind of like the same thing as with use callback. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like if you get it, you get it, but it's hard to explain. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think they still did a, did a brilliant job because they had all those things. Because until the very last episode, everything kept growing more and more complicated, and I thought. Man, they are really, really gonna screw this ending. Like, it's gonna be horrible. I, I when I watched the the previous episode uh, before the last one, uh, I thought, man, this got even more complicated. There is no way they're gonna resolve all this thing, explain it, give a satisfying ending. Like, I was prepared for like a train wreck. Like, it was gonna be some mystique, something, something that was, yeah. And then they gave us this ending. They they tied everything beautifully, like the motivations of everyone and how some people like exist in this timeline and others don't. You like get the whole picture. Uh, so yeah, that they did an amazing job with that. Like uh, lots of respect. Even if it was kind of even worse than it was, it would still be great because you have like this whole uh, interconnected like timelines, branches, different dimensions, and so on and so on. And people with really different motivations, and some of them don't even really exist. Um, so yeah, they, they really did a cool ending. It explains, and, it, and it's kind of nice. satisfied, right? It was a bit like bittersweet, like like watching Lord of the Rings or something, yeah. Um, but 1899, yeah, it's canceled. Nice. <laughs> um, not the part about being canceled, but... I will consider checking it out. Mm -hmm. um, my pick is gonna be in the same line, but so in the in the line of it is a show from Netflix, but it's completely different from 1899. So I'd like to pick the Mo. Watch, it's a reality show. 
And it's a competition where a group of people, they are trying to complete tasks. And every time they complete the tasks, they can get money to a prize pot. And then the only one left at the end is the one that takes all the money. But the thing is, one person in the group is a mole. So which means that it's a person that talks directly to the producers of the show. This person always knows what's about to happen on the day. And this person is always trying to sabotage the operation because the objective of this person is to reduce the amount of money that they can get. So it's really, really interesting because you follow the trajectory of every single challenge uh, of every single person trying to identify who is the mole. And it, you just think, oh, it's going to be so easy to identify. But I made the wrong assumption so many times during the show, and it just got me hooked. It was a very light show. Uh, a thing that you can watch while you're eating is just something that you can watch and just uh, rest your mind while you're watching, which I enjoyed a lot. So definitely recommend The Mo on Netflix. Guys, thank you so much for the episode today. Armin, you brought up a lot of interesting changes from the newest versions of NGRX. We also got to talk a lot about functional programming, some of our opinions on the technology surrounding the framework and this paradigm that is rising up in terms of popularity. Um, thank you so much for all the insights that you brought here today. And I am out. Bye.